Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Matthias Durten from Technical University of Munich, who will be giving a talk on half track criterion for identifiability of latent variable models. Uh, in QA, we have Niels Sturma, who is uh, also from the Technical University of Munich, uh, who will be answering some of your questions that you submit live. So please do feel free to submit questions live. Uh, the discussant for today's talk is Robin Evans from the University of Oxford, so we also look forward to hearing this discussion from him later on. I will now switch over to Qin Yuan, who is handling questions. Yes, um, just a very uh, quick reminder uh, for, uh, for anyone new to this uh, seminar. Please do not use the chat box to submit your question. Instead, use the Q&A, um, so this will allow um, Nils uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the panel to uh, answer your question and select questions for, um, uh, for Matthias to answer live. Um, other than that, I don't have anything else. Um, Matthias, the stage is all yours. Okay. All right. So then I'll share screen. That looks great. Okay, so I'm presenting a paper by the, with the same title as the slides have here. So this is called a half track criterion for identifiability of latent variable models. And this is joint work with uh, Rena Barber from the University of Chicago and with uh, Niels Sturmer, who's uh, here um, looking at, at the Q&A and he's a PhD student uh, in Munich and with Luca Weiss, who's a, who's a graduate of the um, statistics program at UW, who did his PhD there and is now at the Allen Institute of AI. Um, so what this is, is this about? So this will be a talk about linear uh, structural equation models or sprint linear structural causal models. Also, I'll be talking only about uh, the observational world. And in, this class of models, I'm thinking about each model as it is induced by a, a, a causal DAG or a directed graph. I guess I shouldn't say a DAG, it's uh, induced by a directed graph. And uh, it's uh, to give an, a running example for the beginning here, I've taken this instrumental variables model where at a, at a qualitative level, the model is uh, described by, this, by, the, by the edges of this graph. So I'm, I'm thinking about a setting where I have three observed variables and one latent variable here. And the three observed variables are a tax rate, um, smoking, and how much a mom smokes uh, during uh, pregnancy and then the baby's weight at birth. So this is about uh, modeling a sample of, of pregnancies. And these are the three things we get data on, but then maybe we also worry about latent confounders like socioeconomic factors or something like that. And so each model is induced by such a graph. Um, I'm coloring here, and I'm using gray shade for observed nodes. Um, if it's not filled in, it's a latent variable. And then there are edges that qualitatively tell me how different variables uh, are interrelated. And the blue edges are, in, are shown in blue because they relate to observed variables and the red things are edges that uh, point away from latent variables. So they give us latent confound. And, and so this quantitatively, this uh, picture is turned into a model via linear structural equations here. And so for each variable, we're gonna write an equation. So I'm just gonna look at one. So let's say X2. X2 is uh, written to be a linear function of parent variables and noise. And so the parent variables are the ones where there's edges coming from. So the tax rate variable and the confounder. And so I'm gonna write X2 is a linear function of X1 and L1 here. And there are coefficients that sit on these edges as weights. And then there is noise to make these relationships stochastic. And each variable and each equation gets its own noise. And then the starting point is that the errors in these equations, they are all independent. So they're simply modeling noise. And I'm going to assume that each one of them has a finite variance. And so we can talk about the covariance structure in this, in this model. And then what this talk is about, is if I get to have data on the three variables in gray, then in particular, I have a, um, 
observable covariance matrix for the three variables. And then what I want to know is that even if I have this latent variable, this unobserved variable, can I still recover the coefficients that appear in this equation system, the coefficients that appear on the edges that are blue, that are between observable variables, can I recover those from the covariance matrix of the three observed guys? So the notation will be these blue lambdas are gonna be the coefficients on the blue edges that are joining um, uh, observed variables. Um, and sigma will be my canonical symbol for the observed covariance matrix or the covariance matrix of in this example, x1, x2, x3. So this is what this talk is about. So can we decide whether I can recover these direct effects? And then uh, staying with this example, so just let's just do it in this example. So this is of course this uh, famous instrumental variable model. Um, here, the graph abstracted of its context, I have three observed variables and one latent. If I think about the uh, observed variables, their equations in a compact form, I'm writing the vector of observed variables is a um, matrix, a product of a matrix uh, times this vector of uh, observed variables plus something coming from the latent variable plus a noise vector. And so here I'm just showing you these sparse matrices that appear in these in this vector equations. So there's this sparse matrix uh, lambda in blue that has only these blue, blue uh, these entries coming from these blue edges. And then in this case here, this is a this matrix is just a vector because I have only one latent variable, but it's also sparse uh, since this latent variable does not have an effect on the tax rate according to the model. Um, Okay, so I have this, uh, this is the this uh, summary of these equations in the vector form. And then I can go ahead and I just calculate by elementary means what the covariance matrix is for the three variables x1, x2, x3. And so I'm calculating some three by three matrix and you see that the, the entries are um, some polynomials in these uh, edge coefficients as well as the variances omega one, omega two, omega three that I have for these errors. And when you inspect these uh, polynomial expressions, then you observe that indeed I can recover these blue edges very easily. I can take the ratio of the covariance sigma one, two and sigma one, one, and that will recover lambda one, two. And so this is a rational expression that recovers this coefficient lambda one, two. And this is a nice rational expression that has a denominator that is always positive for any positive definite matrix. And similarly, if I form a ratio of the covariance one, three and the covariance one, two, I recover this coefficient lambda two, three. And now I have to be a little bit more careful. I have to spend some thought on what about this denominator? So this is a covariance that can be zero, but it is zero only if this edge weight lambda one, two is zero. So in a sense, when I think about a generically posed problem in which the um, distribution that I studied is obtained by picking random choices of making random choices of these coefficients, then um, this denominator will be indeed uh, non-zero with probability one if I make almost sure choices. Uh, almost uh, continuous uh, um, uh, choices from a continuous distribution. Okay, so, so this is the setup. So I'll be considering these types of models, covariance matrices of this type, and I will ask, are there rational formulas that compute back these coefficients that I want? And so I thought I'm going to already uh, take a little breather here and ask if there's any questions about uh, um, the models, the setup. Um, I assume many of you know this very well, but uh, perhaps there are some questions. Um, so that popped actually, up. It's actually a good time. There's a question uh, that just pops up. Uh, on slide two, when you write down the structural equations with matrices, should the x1, x2, x3 calling vector on the right-hand side be one x1, x2? I guess it's uh, the- uh, Ah, okay. So, all right. Yeah. Yes, I think maybe uh, the, the thing is that I'm transposing this matrix. Sorry, I didn't emphasize this, but so I, I have to sort of make a choice. Either I write a matrix here transposed or not. So I'm gonna transpose this matrix so that the entries of the matrix match the edges as they point. So I guess perhaps even more customary is to not transpose in which case this lambda one, two would wander down into this uh, second row. And then it would write X one as a function, of, X two as a function of X one, okay? 
So um, I guess part of the question the is, is about the intercept. I guess you you're assuming the variables are. Oh 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 sorry yes sorry the one thing I did is I uh, jumped ahead and since it's all about the covariance structure I will drop the intercepts. I'm sorry yes. Um, I'm going to drop the intercepts going forward. There's nothing interesting about them. Uh, it's sort of funny to omit them when you present the model at first, but uh, there's nothing, no interesting structures. It'll all be about covariance matrices, and those will be un not affected by whether I have this this intercept or not. Yes, um, I think we we don't have any more questions okay. at this point. Okay, so then. Um, what's the general setup that we're going to treat? So the general setup will be, I have a collection of observed variables X, they are indexed by a set V, and I have a bunch of latent variables that are indexed by a set script L. And over these uh, variables or just their indices, I will have a directed graph that has some set of edges D. And I don't actually have to worry about the, DAG being a, uh, the graph being a DAG or not, so cycles are fine directly set here. But I do want to make, um, I'm going to make an assumption about the nature of the latent variables. I'm going to assume that they're all latent factors, meaning that they're all source nodes in the graph. So they do not uh, depend, uh, there's no interdependence between the latent variables and also observed variables don't affect latent variables. In that case, I can summarize my model simply by the equations for the observed variables. And they take again this form. So the vector X is lambda transpose X plus gamma transpose L the latents plus noise. And the latent variables now is given the source node nature here, the latent variables, they're independent of these noise terms and all the random variables in L and epsilon are actually all independent of each other. Uh, so this means that the covariance matrix of epsilon is a diagonal matrix that I'm gonna call omega diag here. The entries are little omega Vs. And the covariance matrix of L is diagonal. And since the latent variables, they their scale cannot be identified. I'm just going to, without loss of generality, scale them to be variance one. So the covariance matrix of the vector of latent variables L is going to be the identity. And then a model is really obtained from the graph by making an assumption of sparsity in the matrices lambda and gamma. So the sparsity of the, of the form they're supported over the edge set. So that means they can only have non-zero entries in places where there's an edge. And then what we want to study is this uh, recover this identification problem recovering the edge coefficients on the blue observable edges. Eh? So I have given a latent factor graph as 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 I defined on the previous as I laid out on the previous slide. I'm going to have a parameterization mapping that takes such a sparse matrix lambda, a sparse matrix gamma, a diagonal matrix for the error, with the error variances, and it maps them to the observed covariance matrix. And then the question is whether I can recover lambda from the output of this mapping. And I want to do this via a rational map. So I want to decide whether the model given by this graph G is rationally identifiable. And that is the case if there is a rational map that recomputes from the output of the parameterization from the observed covariance, the coordinate lambda, so the collection of these direct effects among observables. And as I say, a rational map, I want to consider the setting where the, the denominator, it doesn't have to be always non-zero, but it has to be non-zero um, for almost all choices of the parameters in my model, okay? So this is then the problem that we wanna uh, study, decide rational identifiability. And what we're gonna, the main contribution of the paper is a sufficient condition for this property. And this sufficient condition comes in the form of a recursive algorithm that I'm going to just say here now is polynomial time, but um, you can push me on that later. And so the condition is not necessary, uh, but I'm going to say it's effective. So we explored it in simulations in the paper exactly what sort of ground we can cover with it. But so I want to tell you about the sufficient condition. Um, the product of the work, uh, in a way, really is, uh, is the software. So we have an R package that uh, existed in, in prior versions um, that was started by uh, Luca and then um, now has this uh, new work built in that uh, is in this new paper. And then this, so just to give you an impression, so in this software, by means of adjacency matrices and labeling nodes, you can define a, a DAG with latent variables and observed variables, blue and red. And then you can ask, what about identifiability? with this latent factor half-trick criterion. And then the code will, uh, uh, or the uh, 
the, the code will return an answer to that. And in this case here, for this example, it'll tell us that all the blue edges, all the coefficients on them can indeed be um, recovered as rational functions of the observed covariance matrix, this five by five matrix for the blue variables, okay? And so I'll invite you to try this out. You can get this on cron. Um, okay, so what's going on here? So, so the paper is about this, this uh, in a way about this interplay between uh, a late, what I call a latent covariance matrix and the observed covariance matrix. So when you think at back up about this model equation, so the observed X is a uh, linear transformation of itself plus some unobserved part that involves on one hand noise, independently varying noise, and then the contributions of the latent variable. So there's this unobserved part. And so if I want to, I can solve for X and writing it as a transformation of this unobserved part. So if I do that, there's an identity matrix over here, lambda transpose over there. So it's identity minus lambda um, um, inverted and transpose times this unobserved part. And then, um, so then I have these two things. I have the observed X and I have the unobserved part. And so the late, by latent covariance matrix, I mean the matrix that we in the paper call omega, which is the covariance matrix of this latent part. And this covariance matrix, in this case here, is a, is a, a very tractable structure. So by the, by the fact that all the latent variables are source nodes, I have independence here. So this becomes a sum of two terms. The first one is diagonal. This is just noise. And the second part is the conjugation of the covariance matrix of the latents, which is the identity with this matrix gamma transpose that describes how the latents affect the observed, okay? And so then now of note is that this matrix has an interesting structure. It's, the, it's a sum of a diagonal matrix plus a bunch of rank one matrices that come from um, this matrix product. So there's a bunch of column vectors that are being multiplied to their transpose in this expression here in this product, okay? And so these are, the column vectors that tell me what is the effect of the latent variable index by h on all the observables. And so the structure of this latent covariance matrix is the structure of a diagonal matrix plus a sum of rank one matrices, which may also be sparse because as in the IV model, I may have that a latent variable only affects some of the observables, not all of them. So that's the latent covariance matrix. And when I then move to the observed covariance matrix, I just have to pass this uh, random vector with this covariance matrix omega through this uh, linear mapping here. And the covariance matrix of the observables is then uh, identity minus this matrix of edge coefficients, uh, lambda inverted transposed omega identity minus lambda inverted, okay? And this is where it starts now. So, this is the mapping. So this, this tells me how the matrix sigma is determined in terms of, is determined by the parameters of the model. So there's the lambda, there's the gamma, there's the omega diag. And so what I need to do is I need to see whether I can somehow based on the form of these uh, coordinates of, of sigma, whether I can recover the lambdas. Now, but looking at the entries in sigma is sort of hard. So. There's a much easier way of looking at the problem that we leverage in our work. And that is by, instead of thinking about how sigma is really parametrized by all of the model parameters, I'm gonna think about how I can recover the latent covariance matrix from the observed. So if I wanna, if you give me the observed one and I wanna go back to the latent one, what I need to do is I just multiply away the sandwiching identity minus lambda. Okay? So the latent covariance matrix if you tell me what lambda is, you can recompute from the observed covariance matrix as identity minus lambda transpose, sigma identity minus lambda. And then what I can then do is I can think about algebraic relations that hold among the entries of this latent covariance matrix omega. And if I ever can think of some polynomial that vanishes when I evaluate it over a latent covariance matrix coming from my model, then I also know that the same polynomial must vanish when I evaluate it on this, on this product of three matrices here. But when there is a polynomial that is zero, when I evaluate it on this matrix here, that means that I find a relation between the entries of lambda and sigma. 
And this is what I want to do, right? I want to find relations between lambda and sigma that I can then solve to determine the entries of lambda as a function of sigma. Okay, and so to show you this in the IV example, how easy this is, this IV example. So in the IV example, the latent covariance matrix, you just have to think about, forget about the blue edges, just look at the red part of the graph. What's the parametrization? Well, it's there's variances for the three nodes coming from noise, and then there's latent confounding by one variable that only affects two and three. So that means that the latent covariance matrix in particular has two zero entries coming from the fact that variable one is not subject to this latent confounding. Okay. Now, let me just pick one of the, so this, these are relations, right? The fact that omega has a zero entry is a relation. It tells me omega one, three, for example, is zero. So this is a very trivial polynomial in omega that is zero. But I can use this polynomial and say, I can then therefore have that when I form this sandwich matrix here and I evaluate its one, three entry, this must be zero if sigma comes from a parameterization of the graph in which lambda was used um, for the um, edge weights. But then if I look at what this actually is, so this is actually simply sigma one, three minus lambda two, three, sigma one, two. Okay. So this is a linear equation that immediately gives me this instrumental variables estimator that comes from the ratio of sigma one, three and sigma one, two, okay? And so from this perspective, what, the way to think about this problem is you should think about what are the algebraic relations you can find out about the covariance, latent covariance matrix. And then whenever you know some, you can try and leverage them to get relations between lambda and sigma that then tell you what lambda is as a function of sigma. And so you can, turn this into a fully um, algebraic way of solving the problem. So you can actually solve the problem by a Ribner basis computation and decide this. But so this is feasible in interesting problems, but on a, on a smaller scale, right? Not, it doesn't allow you to go um, to a setting with uh, a larger number of variables. And so at this point, I'm gonna stop again for, for questions. Um, yes, there is a question uh, in the Q&A. What is the significance of rationality of the map? Are there important cases where the effects are identifiable but not by a rational map? Yeah, so, so this could of course be that you come up with some other equation somehow that between an entry in lambda and the entries in sigma that is not. So, so the, the meaning of rationality is really, so if I find, linear equations here that involve entries in sigma and the thing I want to solve for, solving a linear system gives you a, a rational mapping back, right? And so if, there could be cases where you have a higher order polynomial equation, for instance, and uh, but if you could argue that it has a unique solution, um, then over the real somehow, then you could still say this is identifiable, right? And, and there are some interesting cases where people looked at things more from a point of view, some eigenvalue computations. And, but uh, in this realm here, the, the significance of rationality is really the fact that I'm going to find relations that are linear in the things I wanna solve for. And then I'm gonna solve linear equation systems and the solution to a linear equation system then uh, gives rise to a rational map in terms of sigma. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, please continue. Okay, so so this is fine. So they can do this uh, in an algebraic way. But so to go and uh, get more scalable methods, the uh, hope is to do something combinatorial. So to answer the question whether something can be rationally identified, um, we just want to look at the graph and not do any computations with polynomials. And indeed there's hope, right? So if you look at the structure of the observed covariance matrix in, in, in such models, you see lots of interesting combinatorics. So for instance, if you take this picture on the right-hand side, you take a graph like that, there's one latent variable sitting up there. The rest I'm gonna say is observed. And I ask you, what is the covariance between variable one and variable two? Then it turns out that this covariance is a sum of two terms that are of two products. And you can see how these products have to do with the paths in the graph. So if you trace, so lambda three, one is a coefficient here, then there are two red coefficients to go here, and then you go back down. And then there's another 
uh, term here that is there's something coming from one and then you follow the edges along and you somehow pick up these edge weights. There's also a third path connecting, but that doesn't seem to contribute anything. Right? But there's some very nice structure in this. And this is of course very well understood. And so this is for, has been understood for a long, long time, over a hundred years. Um, um, this is the track rule that goes back to Sol Wright's work that says that if you look in these models, if you look at the covariance between two variables indexed by V and W, then this covariance is a sum of products along tracks. So just think about, so when you compute this covariance, you have to evaluate this matrix product. So that's gonna be a bunch of summations as you multiply along um, these matrices, but then you get a summation. And every time you get a term that is a product of an entry from this guy, an entry from that guy, an entry from that guy. And then it turns out that these types of matrices are path matrices. So you can think about them as a geometric series. And then you think about what you learned about Markov chains. And for instance, lambda squared would be a matrix that has uh, that captures what comes from paths of length two in a, in a graph. And so piecing this together, you have this result that um, the entries in the covariance matrix, they have to do with tracks and tracks are paths that first go here. They follow a directed path, but because of the transpose, it goes against the flow of edges. Then we pick out an entry from omega that in this case here is just visit a latent and come back in my setup of a latent factor graph. And then you have an entry or, uh, from this matrix, which corresponds to another directed path. You can also hit a diagonal entry here and just a, a noise variant. So that corresponds to a track of this one. But track, it's track because you have to go up and then down. You can go up and you can go down, but you cannot go first down and then back up. So that's not allowed. So this, this rule explains exactly these expressions. And so because of this combinatorial representation of the, um, of really of this mapping from lambda omega and uh, yeah, lambda and omega and lambda uh, gamma and uh, area variances that are behind this omega um, to the observed covariances because of this combinatorial nature, you have, the natural hope is to develop some combinatorial way of deciding this problem. And so this is what we did in a paper from a little while ago um, with the same um, co-author Rina and Jan Dreisma. And what we did there is we, we looked at only one type of relation in the latent covariance matrix, and namely the relation that some entries are zero. So this means we're gonna look at pairs of variables VW for which there is no latent confounding. So pairs of variables for which there's no latent confounding. So there's no latent variable that affects both V and W in the graph. And whenever I have no latent confounding in the latent covariance matrix, there will be a zero. And therefore this sandwiched matrix has to have a zero entry as well. And what we then do is we take this uh, a collection of these equations that I get from uh, zeros. And we think about them as we, we linearize with respect to one of these lambdas and we build linear equation systems, okay? So these linear equation systems, they um, hopefully will be such that the coefficients that you need to think about have all been determined are either functions of sigma directly, sigma the observed covariance, or if you've already determined them. And then we, we find ways to construct uh, uh, linear equation systems that columns of the matrix lambda that I want to recover have to satisfy. And when I talk about a column here, you see this parent. So parents, this stands for the observed parents of a node V. And so this is there because only over the parents can I have a non-zero effect, direct effect. So this, this entire column of lambda has a bunch of zeros and the non-zero entries, they have to be in over this set of parents. So we can find some linear equation systems that our vector has to satisfy. And then for identifiability, the key question is whether when we put up such an equation system, whether this has a unique solution. So we need to check invertibility of such a matrix. And so this can be done combinatorially with the help of a sort of generalized version of a tool that is called the gessel vno lemma that allows you to decide when um, path matrices of this type have sub-determinants that are non-zero, okay? 
So in order to check the invertibility of this, you have to think about some determinant. You have to decide whether it's non-zero. And you can do this um, combinatorially. You can decide whether it is non-zero for almost every choice of parameters with the help of a, of a combinatorial lemma. And then we also tackled computation uh, in terms of the problem of finding suitable equations. This will be some looking like a complicated combinatorial search, but we can actually make this a polynomial time algorithm by setting up some network flow problems, but I don't have time to tell you about. Here's a little cavity uh, subtlety on the bottom. So this paper, when you read it, it will not be about um, graphs with explicit latent variables, but rather about uh, um, mixed graphs. And there's some subtle differences, but uh, I'm not gonna get into this right now. Here's an example of the sorts of things we can do with our criterion. So for instance, suppose we wanna solve for the blue edges that point to node one here, then what in our algorithm is happening is we find other variables that are not subject to latent confounding with one. So for instance, five, and two are variables where there's no latent confounding, okay? So I know that there's two equations, namely the five one entry and the two one entry of this matrix here, they have to be zero. Then I'm gonna just expand this out, what this is as a function of lambda, of, of lambda that I wanna solve for. And I'm gonna focus on the two coefficients that I want to solve for in the first column of lambda. And so these are these two guys. And you see that since I'm only looking at off-diagonal entries here, there will be no squares. So this is a multilinear equation. And so in particular, it's linear in the things I wanna solve for. Now it can be that um, some other coefficient appears. And so in order to use these equations, I have to, of course, already have, to, have determined this coefficient. So let's suppose I have done that. In, in the other equation, also seemingly, it seems to depend on further coefficients. Actually, it does. So there's some combinatorial insights that we can give to check that even though this seems to depend on other coefficients uh, in lambda here, it doesn't actually because of the structure of the graph. So if sigma comes uh, from this model, then these two terms here cancel. And actually, this is a straight up linear equation in what I want to solve. But so then I find these linear equations and then they effectively, there's a two equations and two unknowns. So there's a coefficient matrix. And then I have to convince you that this is invertible for random choices of the parameters. So when sigma is obtained for random choices of the parameters, this matrix is invertible. And uh, this is again, a bit of a longer story, but effectively there's a witness that this is invertible, a combinatorial witness. And this combinatorial witness is that there's a system of, certain tracks that takes us from the row indices of this matrix to the column indices. So the row indices are the nodes that are not subject to latent confounding that gave me equations. And the column indices are the parents. And so the fact that there's in the graph, there's a certain uh, way to connect these such that the paths that connect don't intersect in a bad way, intersect in a bad way, that'll be a witness to us that this matrix will be invertible for generic choices of parameters. And so I'm gonna take a little break and then tell you more. Um, we don't have any questions uh, at the moment. Um, we actually just got one, but uh, I'll just okay. remind Matthias, you, we have like 12-ish more minutes, let's say. Yes, yeah, I'll make it, I'll make it work. Xinyuan, you, and you um, can read out the question if you want. Yes. Yeah, so um, there was a Oh, sorry. Yes, this is a bit of a long question. Uh, so I'm familiar with the work by, for example, Fisher, Rothenberg, mm -hmm. Becker et al., uh, who also suggested sufficient criteria for identification of covariant structure models. Also, more recently, there have been contributions by Brito 2010 and Brito and Pro 2020, uh, 2002. I was wondering how your works extend uh, the prior work on identification. Are your results more general? Yeah, so, so some of the work by Brito and Pearl is very much what inspired our work. And in a way, the Brito and Pearl work operates over here and is much more complicated and ultimately slightly less powerful than the criteria that we derive when we operate on this side here. Short story, okay? But I can tell you more about that. Mm -hmm. But exactly, yeah. So these are the, this is this line of work that in some ways inspired us in, in many ways. Okay. So then, so what's new in our paper, right? So lots of old stuff. So what's new? 
So looking at these zeros in the latent covariance matrix when there is no latent confounding. So this is interesting, very interesting, but there's very simple situations where you can't say anything. And for instance, just take one variable that is affecting everything and is latent and then some of effects among the observables. I can't say anything because they are, the latent covariance matrix is fully dense. It is the sum of a diagonal matrix plus a dense rank one matrix. There's no zeros I can use. So none of these existing methods that focus on using zeros in the latent covariance matrix give me anything. However, this matrix is obviously highly structured, right? It has very low rank, rank one in its off diagonal part. And so this is what our paper does. So our paper generalizes all this work that focused on no latent confounding to use a low rank structure, okay? Latent low rank structure. And so what do we do? So it's the same principle. We're gonna try column by column, identify um, the entries in this matrix lambda. And every time we look at a column, now, instead of looking for zeros that are in the latent covariance matrix, I'm gonna look for a matrix. So looking for zeros is like looking for a little vector of zeros. But now I'm gonna look for an entire matrix that is off diagonal and rank deficient. So a, a rank deficient off diagonal part of this latent covariance matrix. And more precisely, I find one that is where the rank just drops by one. And it is such that it involves only off diagonal entries and it involves the target variable V. And it is such that the column index by target variable V is a linear combination of the other columns of this matrix. So if, there's, if, if it is a linear combination Z then there's some coefficients that write the column for the target variable as other columns. And then I'm going to think about again, so this way of playing between omega and recovering it from the observed and uh, the matrix sigma and the matrix name that I want to get. And then I'm going to start linearizing this and I'm playing very similar games as we played before. It's just a lot more complicated now because we're working with rank constraints and matrices. But I'm going to be able to expand this out and write this as a function of the coefficients I want to recover that come from the parents of V. And I get a bigger linear equation system where in some ways I have to compensate for the fact that I'm using rank by the fact that there are other variables that are not really interested in that just compensate for the effects of the latent variable in this linear equation system, which is now bigger than just involving the variables that I wanna solve for. But nevertheless, we can find such matrices that give us these equations um, in an in a, in a algorithmic way. And we can give combinatorial conditions that ensure that this bigger system still has a unique solution. And now this is where the half tracks come in. So half tracks are just tracks that don't have an upside. That's all. So the tracks go up and down. Half tracks don't go up. They just go down. Or, well, they can go up to a latent variable and then down. And the relevance of these half tracks is that because once you start linearizing this by expanding out here, you'll have a coefficient matrix that looks like this. And by the multiplication on this side, you're removing the left side of the tracks. That's why these half tracks are important. And then I'm gonna not tell you about sided intersections in the formal way, but this is just about, you can think about not uh, tracks not intersecting at all for the purpose of this. And so then this is what our criterion is. We're gonna look for the right matrices to consider. And so we want these matrices to be off diagonal of the right size um, and, uh, and, and be such that I, we have control over the latent variables that do confounding and the rank ultimately. So there's a condition on, so we're gonna find triples of sets to build equations. So this Y and Z will tell me that which off diagonal part of the matrix I look at, Y times Z. And this H will be the set of latent variables I have to worry about. And then I have a cardinality constraint to get the right number of equations. This is just saying an intersection property that makes sure that I look at a off diagonal sub matrix. This controls what are the latent variables that do confound both uh, row and column indices. And once I have these conditions in place, such a triple, if I find such a triple that satisfies these conditions, that means just the matrix that I look at, the submatrix in the latent covariance matrix has this low rank that I want. And then I have another more complicated condition on systems of tracks or half tracks from row indices to column indices um, that have no intersections. And that will be ensuring that 
ultimately equation system has a unique solution to that. Okay. And so then our theorem tells us exactly when we have such a triple satisfying this, this, this criterion, this latent factor half fret criterion, all these conditions, if I have such a triple, if I find it algorithmically, then I can solve for a column and I can tell you that it is a rational function of the observed matrix sigma and certain other columns that I can tell you on, in lambda that I can tell you exactly what they are. And since I know exactly what they are, I can build an algorithm that cycles through the nodes and checks, can I find an equation system that at first, where all the coefficients only depend on sigma, then I solve and I got some first column. Then I can go on and I cycle again. Can I find a, a situation where the dependence is only on sigma and the column that I already solved for? And in this way, I recurse. And this algorithm I can implement in a polynomial time, assuming that the rank that I ever consider is bounded. And we can prove that without a bound on the rank, unfortunately, this is a hard search problem. And so I should stop. Um, I do cover this example very easily now with this method and I invite you to check the slides later and actually go through this if you're interested and check all our one, two, three, four conditions. I'm not gonna do this now, but step-by-step uh, step we can find, so here node one and four, they don't have any parents, there's nothing to do. Then you can solve for the third column. So there's one coefficient, then you can solve for the second and then for the fifth. And this way our algorithm terminates and says this model is rationally identify them. And so here's my last slide, just summing it up. So latent variable modeling is of course super interesting. It's also super complicated. There's very complicated parameterizations and very complicated geometry. And I'm, I'm excited about this work because it puts us in a way in a, in a place uh, or, or step one in a program. So now we can do in this setup all these other things people have done with latent zeros, right? So there's many other uh, bells and whistles people have developed for the half track criterion and earlier methods. And all this can be done again now here and is very interesting to pursue. And so here's the literature uh, plus a little pointer to some more background. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, we have just a couple of questions and then we will uh, switch to uh, discussant. So the first question is, can we use this criterion for solving a reverse problem? For example, we have assumed DAG uh, and now we want to check whether the assumed DAG is correct by looking on zeros of covariance matrix. Um, yes. So. I mean, I guess, so for instance, you can try and find, so it's not so direct yet, but so we could try and find several different equation systems that under a model, a parameter vector has to satisfy. And in this way, you can get a constraint that the model associated to the graph has to satisfy. Does that make sense? So if I if I, let's say I follow our scheme here and I find an equation system that some um, vector of uh, direct effects has to satisfy. And then I find another equation that this guy has to satisfy. And if the observed covariance matrix is, is, is a population covariance matrix and the model is correct, right? Then, then both of these equation systems will hold. But empirically, um, they won't both hold if you if you substitute in an empirical covariance matrix. Um, but then there is a constraint and you can assess whether it is violated in a, in a sort of uh, significant way. And in this way, test whether that, uh, test whether uh, uh, a goodness of fit of the model given by a graph. Okay, it's another question by Thomas Richardson. Is this example related to identific uh, identification criteria by uh, Stan? Fellini and separately Vicard. Sorry, yes, yes, yes. So this is older work that looked at um, exactly. So it looked at uh, ex problems with explicit latent variables, um, just like we do. And we took some of their, uh, or we, we sort of played around with one of their motivating examples in the paper as an initial example. But uh, yeah, 
I should I should know it better in in a way that I do right now. Maybe if Niels knows it better than 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 I do right now, but uh, um, I'm gonna say something like uh, in any time their method can identify something, we can also. Okay, that's great. Um, so let's switch to our discussion, the uh, Robin Evans. Um, Robin, you may share your screen now. I can't do it, Rob. Well. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Right, can everyone see this? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Okay, so thanks very much for uh, inviting me to discuss this paper. I thought it was really interesting. And thanks, Matthias, for your excellent description of it. Um, so I'm just going to start by giving a, a brief sort of summary of the paper. So, I mean, it, obviously, it gives a method for identifying causal effects in linear SEMs where you have explicit latent variables uh, in that model. And you can use it as an alternative to um, previous work of Matthias, which uses a latent projection of that DAG and then uh, applies a criterion called just the half track criterion um, to check whether or not that uh, graph is identifiable. Um, and as well as this, um, they also provide nice fast methods for checking uh, whether the edges into a vertex are LFHTC identifiable, but only if you uh, bound the space of latent factors. And as Matthias said, if you don't bound the space of latent factors, then the search uh, becomes NP complete. Um, okay, so a couple of points I'd like to sort of take up are um, there are cases, um, as, as Matthias mentions in the paper, where the model you get is not generically identifiable. But when you project it, when you do the latent projection to get a mixed graph with these bi directed edges instead of the latent variable, then that model is generically identifiable. So you might think, okay, well, in that case, well, I should just project it, um, run the identification and get what the causal effects are. But the problem is, as I'll show an example in a second, that if the original model is correct, then you're guaranteed to be at a point where one of these lower dimensional points where it's not identifiable. So, so the idea is that generically identifiable just means there's a space of lower dimension um, where your model is not identifiable. And if you project into a model that has a higher dimension, you might suddenly become generically identifiable. But if you believed the original model, then when you try and run your identification, you'll find that you're at a, a singular point um, where you're effectively trying to divide by zero or empirically divide by zero. So the other nice thing about this work is that you can extend it using something called Tian decomposition, um, named after uh, Jin Tian, who first described this in 2005. Um, and the idea is that sometimes you have a graph which is not um, LFHTC identifiable, but you can factorize it into districts or C components, which individually each are um, LFHTC identifiable. And I'll give an example of that in a second. So let's start with the identifiability example. So this is adapted from uh, figure five in the, in the paper. So it shows um, a graph where it's effectively an IV model, right? So there are two treatments, three and four, confounded with the outcome five, but there are also a couple of instruments, a one and two. And um, what this model is telling us is that, um, so, if, so we could just sort of check the LFHTC identifiability, and you can see that it won't work because um, I can have a, a half track from one to three just by going by H1, but once I've done that, I can't have a half trek from two because the only way I could get there is also via H1. And we know the half treks aren't allowed to intersect. And if you know anything about IV models, uh, you'll know that you need to have at least as many instruments as you do treatments in order to identify these two edges from three and four to five. And of course we do, but because we've got this latent variable here it acts as a sort of choke point, And it means that you don't have um, the dimension two that you need um, in this relationship. So then what you might think to do is, well, maybe if I project this, I'll find a model which is identifiable generically. And indeed, if you project, you get this model here, 
And in this case, now the relationship between the two instruments and the treatments is saturated because every edge is present. So now you might think, aha, okay, now I can identify these causal effects. But of course, if you believe that actually the model looks like this, then you will be at a point of non-identifiability in this model, and you won't be able to identify what happens. So you'll be on this smaller dimensional subspace um, because of the model you started with. So that's just a sort of warning that um, HTC identifiability won't be able to get you out of jail if you're up in a graph which is not um, generically identifiable. Okay, so now I'm just gonna quickly talk about uh, Tien decomposition, um, which was, uh, as I say, originally developed by Tien Tien in a paper from 2005. And the idea is that you can factorize a distribution over a DAG with certain latents in um, by thinking about districts. And a district is just a set of observed vertices that is connected by latent variables. I'll show you an example in a second. And it turns out you can write um, the joint distribution as a product over each of the districts in the set um, curly D, and you get a kernel here. And the kernel is just a product of univariate, um, univariate densities from the original distribution P. So here's a quick example. Here I've got a graph with two districts. So one is joined to two and two is joined to five. So one, two, five forms the first district and three is joined to four. So three, four forms the other district. And we can sort of highlight that so you can see. And if we look at these um, two products, so here I've chosen the topological order one, two, three, four, five. So I'll get the uh, marginal distribution of X1 and X2 and the conditional distribution of X5 given X1, two, three, and four. And for the other district, I'll just get um, Three, three and four conditional on one and two. So now the idea is if I want to identify um, the coefficients in this graph here, I can factorize it and say, okay, I'm gonna first identify the effects in this graph with just one, two and five, and then the parent four. And that will be easy because I just have to regress five on four. And then separately, I can identify the effects in the graph three and four again, just by regressing three on one and four on two. So it gives a way of um, identifying effects that might otherwise not be identifiable. And of course, if it's a multivariate Gaussian distribution, then each of these factors is just a linear regression of this variable on all of the variables that came before it in the ordering that we chose. So here's a, an example from um, a paper by Matthias and, and Luca from 2016. So the first thing to note is that here there's only one district. Um, everything is connected by latents. But if we look at the vertex six, you can check relatively straightforwardly that it satisfies, sorry, that the set three, four satisfies the latent factor half track criterion with respect to six. So you can see that uh, six has two parents, one and two. And there's a latent half track from latent factor half track from three to two via H1 and the latent factor half track from four to one via H3. So this triple here satisfies the half track criteria for six. So that means that if we can identify all these blue edges up here, then we're done. Okay, so we can now just marginalize six. And now we're in a situation where we do have two separate districts. So we, we can now split the graph apart um, and consider the two districts separately. So if we start with the district over one and four, you can see pretty easily that everything is gonna be identifiable in this graph. So I just regress four on two and three. And in the other graph, you can also check that it satisfies uh, the half track criteria, the latent factor half track criterion um, with these two latents here. Okay, so now we've had a graph that this is not latent half track, latent factor half track identifiable, but uh, we, by decomposing it into separate districts, we actually are able to identify all the, the blue edges. So you get a bit more out of this method than you might immediately think. Okay, so now I have a few questions for Matthias. So your original paper um, was really nice. It had a, a very nice sufficient criteria for identifiability, but there was also a, a, a necessary condition for identifiability. So my, I guess my question is, is there a similar result for non-identifiability with the latent factor half-track criteria that allows you to, to rule out a large 
um, proportion of graphs. Um, and then other questions are sort of slightly more um, about the what the power of this method is. So um, of the graphs over say four, five, four, four or five, six, seven variables with some fixed number of latents, what proportion are now known to be identifiable and not identifiable? And separately, sort of how much do you gain by Tien decomposition? So I don't think your, your paper on Tien decomposition didn't really have any numerical results about how many extra graphs were identifiable as a result. So um, I'd be interested uh, if you could answer that question for me. Thank you very much. I am uh, jumping in. Uh, yeah, great. I okay. would like to respond, uh, Matthias. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the first question is 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 very natural. So in the in the in the previous setting, um, we in this in this as, as as Robin pointed out in this mixed graph setting, really this the structure of this latent covariance matrix is that it has some zeros. And the other entries in the latent covariance matrix are completely free. So there are no other relations. <clears throat> and in particular, it's very obvious what the dimension of the um, set of latent covariance matrices is, is that you get out of, out of the setup. And, um, and, and the parameterization of the latent covariance matrix is also in a way trivial. It's simply mapping free entries and fill them in a matrix. Um, and so in that setting, we were able to look at the Jacobian of the mapping from parameters to observed covariance matrix. And if this Jacobian does not have full column rank, then we could um, deduce that the model cannot be or, uh, identifiable. Huh? All parameters cannot be identified. So now in, in, in so we're not there yet for, for this setup. So in this setup, so we, in the paper, we discuss a bit of a dimension criterion. So if you think about the dimension of this, the set of all latent covariance matrices, um, if that plus the number of um, direct effects that you have between observables, if that is already bigger than the dimension of this a space of, of, of the cone of positive definite matrices that you observe covariance matrix lives in, then you cannot be um, identifiable. But um, that is a very, weak condition and it's nowhere as good as this analysis of the Jacobian that we had previously. So I guess in a way we need to better understand how we can make an argument based on Jacobians when we have this more complicated parameterization of the latent covariance matrix. So this is a very uh, good question, but so I don't have a, 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 an answer yet, but this is a very interesting problem to study. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess, question two and three. so. Uh, yeah, so so Robin is absolutely right. So this was one of the things that um, one of the many surprising things in the old project, um, when at some point uh, um, we we came across or were told to look at the decomposition. I don't remember anymore how it went. And so initially, I thought, well, yeah, nothing much is going to come from this decomposition. But as Robin also illustrated very nicely here, so this this decomposition somehow. Uh, changes the the equations that you look at um, in terms of uh, sparsity and zeros and omega in a in a very uh, uh, big way and and it's really a it's an in a way it's a very uh, useful change of coordinates to the problem and uh, we, in the old paper we were able to show that decomposing into districts is always beneficial so it, it can never hurt you so you cannot you can it's always good to do that. Um, and so I guess we should be looking at this here, uh, but we haven't explored that uh, uh, to my knowledge, maybe Niels can correct me, but uh, I think in the experiments, we simply looked at the, at the vanilla latent factor half correct criterion. So we had some uh, computations for uh, how many graphs we can uh, on, on, a, on a smaller number of, of nodes, for instance, five or six observed nodes, we have some, severe, some um, uh, numerical experiments that tell us uh, how many uh, graphs are uh, rationally identifiable and how many do we get. And for, for, very, for, for sparse, a small number of uh, effects, then we're, we're, we're pretty good. And then there's some bigger gaps in the settings with higher uh, number of 
larger number of parameters uh, between the observables. But so that um, I guess I have for, for two, maybe UK guys can look in the paper a bit more. And then the, the how much is gained by the Tian decomposition in this setting? Um, yeah, I, this is uh, uh, something on our to-do list now uh, going forward here. But all very Great. good points. Thanks, uh, Matthias, for answering. And thanks, Robin, for, um, for a very nice discussion. We'll just wrap up the talk now. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, once again, thanks, Matthias. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Niels, for participating. And thanks to the audience for the nice questions and Chinyuan for actually leading most of today's session. Uh, so next week, we actually have two PhD talks back to back. Uh, first one from Michael Olbers from MIT on regular, regularizing towards causal invariance, linear models with proxies. And then the second talk will be by Xuanning Li from Stanford on random graph asymptotics for treatment effect estimation under network interference. So hopefully you can all join us for those um, and we'll see you all next week.